Hi, my name is John Savile and I'm here in the Dallas Microsoft Technology Center. And today I wanted to talk about using the cloud for disaster recovery purposes. And why the cloud is so attractive for disaster recovery is it's consumption based. I pay for what I use. That means under normal circumstances, I'm probably not running many services actually in the cloud. It's not paying that much money. In the event I actually have a disaster or maybe a test and I actually fail over to the cloud, that's when I'll start paying compute charges. I'll pay for virtual machines, for example. Then when I fail back or I stop my test, uh, I stop a bulk of that payment again. So there's a variety of reasons we like to use the cloud, but disaster recovery is a huge one. That consumption-based nature makes it very, very attractive. But there are a lot of different services in Azure. There are a lot of different ways to create services in Azure. So my goal for this video is to really just walk through, well, when I'm thinking about protecting my on-premises workloads, how should I protect those to Azure? So I want to start off really thinking more about, well, how would we do it on-premises today? So on-premises today, I can think about, let's say I have two locations. So typically that's what's required. I'll have two locations, I'll have some kind of link between them, uh, a big fat pipe that data can flow. Now when we think about those distances, they should be big enough that if there was a disaster, it wouldn't impact that DR location. So there's a certain distance to travel, to a certain network latency. So when we think about replication, typically it's asynchronous. Asynchronous means, hey, I'm doing a right operation, I acknowledge it to the application straight away, and then on a best efforts basis, I send it over to the other location. That means in an unplanned situation, maybe there's a bit of data loss, but we generally expect that in a DR situation. So I have my second location. How do I replicate today on premises from this location to that location? And the answer is there's, there's different options and there's not a right or wrong. But I can generally think about what do I have? Well, I probably have storage. I probably have a hypervisor. I have an operating system running inside virtual machines. And then I have my application. And I can probably replicate at any one of those levels. If I'm using storage area networks, if I'm using Windows Server 2016, there's a storage replica feature. So I could absolutely replicate kind of at a storage level. It's not aware of the application, but, it, but it's something. I could maybe replicate at the hypervisor level, for example, Hyper-V replica that will asynchronously replicate the changes to virtual hard disks from one location to another. So I could replicate from the hypervisor. I could do a replication from within the guest operating system. Now there's a number of different ways to do this. If it was a data disk, again I can get into the storage replica type solution. There's distributed file system replication. We typically don't use DFSR for sort of DR replication. It only replicates a closed file and often data files are kept open so it wouldn't replicate very well. There may be in-guest agents. If I think about what is an operating system, I kind of think about I have an application, I have a file system, I have a volume driver. And what some solutions will do, and Azure Site Recovery actually has this if I'm replicating from an ESX host, if I'm replicating from a physical box, it will kind of inject its agent between the file system and the volume driver. So as the write goes down, well, it will kind of fracture that write. Yes, it continues going down to actually get to the physical storage, but it will take a copy of that write and send it to other pieces of infrastructure to send it out into the cloud or, or somewhere else. So I could maybe replicate within the operating system. The app may have its own capability. If I think about domain controllers and multi-master replication, they have their own capability. Think about SQL always on, uh, availability groups. It has its own replication capability and so on. So maybe the application has its own capability. Generally, I wanna try and go as high up as I can. If the application has a solution, fantastic. Generally, the app native solution is gonna give me the quickest recovery 
time objective, i.e. how long it will take me to fail over, and my recovery point objective will be smaller. I'll lose less data. If I have a SQL failure and I'm using SQL always on, well, this is running over here, kind of getting that data sent. It knows through the cluster communications this is gone. It very quickly is just now offering the service. If I was replicating maybe just through the hypervisor, then it's going to take longer, longer to notice this is not available, longer to then start the virtual machine on this side. So I'm always sort of balancing those recovery point, recovery time objectives, but there might be a dollar cost as well. So that's why I do on-prem. Why am I spending so much time about on-prem? Because the same thing really translates to the cloud. If I think now the cloud is my target, I can really do the same things. Now, the storage is a little bit different. Um, there's thing called Store Simple. Store Simple is a storage appliance. Uh, I can kind of run that Store Simple appliance on premises. It offers a nice SCSI target. And what that can do is that can kind of do a cloud snapshot. So everything on that device and even other data, the cloud is kind of an additional tier, well, it goes and replicates up into Azure Storage. It's encrypted with a key. But I could create, in the event of a disaster, a virtual store simple appliance that links to this and then starts offering the data out. So at a storage level, uh, I could do that. There are certain partnerships with express route vendors. Or maybe I have a SAN and I replicate that SAN to one of those provider locations. I can't put a SAN in Azure, but maybe I put a SAN in one of those provider locations, replicate there, and they have a very low latency connection into the Azure data centers. So then, hey, I could access it through my Express Route connection. Express Route is a dedicated private connection, typically from your network uh, into Azure services, either an Azure virtual network or other services, depending on the type of peering I use. And I'll talk more about connectivity. But let's, let's look at these other options. So hypervisor level replication. Um, yes, I can do that. So there's a technology called Azure Site Recovery. And Azure Site Recovery has a whole set of capabilities. And it has different channels in which I can replicate data. Now, I can use Azure Site Recovery as an orchestration solution. I could actually replicate on-premises to on-premises. And it would give me a cloud-based solution to actually manage that replication and then orchestrate the failover. But I can also use it to replicate into Azure. So the first one, let's take a hypervisor level access. So Hyper-V. Hyper-V has a technology called Hyper-V Replica. It asynchronously replicates the changes to the storage to another Hyper-V server. Well, in this case, I can think about, I have my Azure storage account. And what I'm going to do there, if I'm using the hypervisor level access, is, well, I have a VM running on-prem. It has virtual hard disk files. And it's going to use Hyper-V Replica to replicate those changes into the storage account. So I'd see the Hyper-V Replica log files, the HRL files, I'd see a VHD, and it's just populating. There is no virtual machine at this point. I'm not paying any compute charges. So what am I paying for? Well, I'm paying for the storage, and I'm paying for an ASR license. And there's two types of ASR licenses. There's one if I'm actually replicating to Azure, and there's another one if I'm just using ASR as the orchestration. I am replicating on-premises to on-premises. So there's two dollar values here. ASR license and the storage. This is going to be pretty small. And it's just going to do that. Replicating. Now, in the event of an actual disaster, at that point, that's when it would create the virtual machine. It would link it to that virtual hard disk, and then during that disaster, during that test, yes, I'm paying for compute charges at that point. Once the test is finished, well, it goes away. And I carry on just paying for the ASR license and the storage. And this is completely agnostic of what's running inside the virtual machine. It does not care. So this is Windows, this is Linux, doesn't matter about the application, 
uh, it's just replicating at that virtual hard disk level. So this will work for pretty much anything. Now, does the app support Hyper-V Replica? Uh, you need to check with the vendor. But this is really agnostic, it should just work. So that's one option, uh, I can replicate Hyper-V Replica. What about if I'm not running on Hyper-V? What about if I'm running on ESX? What about if I'm running on physical machines? Well, this is where we get into the OS level. Remember I talked about this in-guest agent. That's what's utilized. So again, this is still ASR. So what am I paying for? Well, I'm, it's the ASR license again. It's the storage again. It's just the behavior is different. This time, there's gonna be an agent installed into each protected virtual machine. There's also on-premises a configuration server, a process server. Because what's going to happen is, as those writes go through and they fracture out, well, those writes actually get sent to this process server box on premises. That process server box then takes that data and sends it up into Azure, where it's kind of a master target. It connects to a bunch of virtual hard disks and makes those writes. It takes care of disabling VMware tools, for example. Doesn't care. So now in the event of a failover, same thing again. What am I paying for? I'm paying for the ASR license and the storage. There's no ongoing compute charge. I don't see this master target, it's just part of ASR. In the event of a failover or event of a test, once again, it creates the VM. I start paying compute charges for the VM. The master target would disconnect from the VHD and it would attach to the VM instead. It can then reverse the replication. So I should have stated this. If I'm using the Hyper-V replica, when I want to fail back, we just reverse the replication. If I'm using the in-guest agent approach, it would reverse the replication. Now, I would stress, I cannot fail back to physical. I have to fail back to ESX. So if I was protecting a physical box, and I did fail over, the fail back, I would have to fail back to ESX. There is not a fail back to physical hardware today. So I, I can protect at the OS level. I have that choice. I can protect at the app. If the app has a solution, then I can leverage that. Now if I'm using the app, then it's different. So ordinarily, remember, there, there's no VM. I'm paying for an ASR license, if I'm replicating a hyper replica, or the in-guest agent, and the storage that's associated. If I want the app level, it's a little bit different because I'm probably going to need the app running over here. I've got a VM, so I'm paying compute charges. It's going to attach to virtual hard disks, so I've got storage charges, but I'm not paying an ASR license anymore. I'm not doing that. I'm just now running VM with my app. And then I'll use whatever the application's replication technology is, be it domain controller multi-master replication, be it SQL always on, it really doesn't matter. At this point, I'm just replicating. So I have that choice. And generally, we do want to go as high up as possible. If the app has its own capability, I want to use that. So if I've had SQL Server, I would rather use SQL always on uh, to replicate to Azure. If there's not a native app solution, then sure. I'll use either the in-guest agent if I'm on ESX or physical, or I can use Hyper-V Replica if I'm running on Hyper-V. But there is a difference in cost. If this is my tier one super important SQL server, I'm willing to pay the extra. Because this compute charge is likely gonna be more than the cost of an ASR license. So yes, I'm getting a reduced recovery time I'm going to be up much faster, so I've got a better RTO and RPO, but I'm paying more money for it. So I'm always weighing this. Okay, well I can get a better RPO, RTO, it's costing me more money. This is a disaster, and we're talking about an unplanned failover. If it's planned, I'm not losing anything. If it's planned, and I'm using Hyper-V Replica or the in-guest, it will shut it down. It will complete any replication of data and then start up. I don't lose anything. There's some downtime, but it's a planned downtime. This is a disaster recovery solution. I'm probably fine with that. 
is in an unplanned, hey, where the data center go? That's when I'm really going to see a difference in potential data loss. So yes, I'm going to get a better recovery point, better recovery time objective, but I have to wait. Well, if it's costing me a huge amount more money, how much is that worth to me? And what I typically see is, again, that tier one SQL database, those critical workloads, if it's a domain controller, I've probably got that replicating an app level. But other services that aren't so important that, you know, if I lose five minutes of data, who cares? Uh, I'd rather save the money. I'll use Azure Site Recovery. Now, when I do think about replicating all of this data, well, this pipe is very important. Ordinarily, this would replicate over the internet. And it would be encrypted with SSL, but it's gone over the internet. The speed, who knows? Not consistent. So one of the nice things to have here is kind of the express route pipe. So if I have express route, then if I turn on public peering, public peering means all of the Azure services will also be accessible via that pipe rather than just connecting this network to a virtual network in Azure, that ASR traffic would flow over that express route connection as well. So it's a dedicated connection, I get much higher speeds and predictable latencies. So I'm probably going to have the traffic going that way. This is all great. But there are some services where actually I don't think this is the best approach. Exchange. Uh, Skype. I'm in a disaster. Everything's going wrong. I can't mail people. I can't Skype people. Maybe I'm using voice over IP. I can't call people. Because I need to fail that process over as well. So for some services, I'm actually a big fan of just move it to the cloud preemptively i.e. Office 365. So this is running sort of in the Microsoft Cloud. I'll go to Office 365. That gives me my email, my SharePoint where maybe I'm storing processes, my Skype. So then in the event of a disaster, I'm not worrying about how I'm communicating, how I'm collaborating. It's there. That's Microsoft's responsibility to make sure that service is available. It's separate from my on-prem infrastructure. So even if I have a disaster here, that's not going to be impacted. So not only am I not worrying about Office um, servers anymore, my Exchange, my SharePoint, my Skype, I'm actually going to have it available as part of my plan, as part of my collaboration, my communication. It will just be there. So when I think about those types of services, maybe just moving it ahead of time is a better option. Now you might say, okay, well this is great. Um, you're moving these things, you're replicating, in the event of a disaster, it's there already, or maybe I'm creating the VMs. But I have things coming in and pointing to these IP addresses. So how is that going to work if I move the workload into the cloud? It's going to have a different public IP address. That's where things like Azure Traffic Manager comes in. So with Azure Traffic Manager, I can think about, it's really a, a DNS redirection service. I have a name something traffic manager dot net so it's your service whatever I can hide that alias I can put a vanity domain so I can create a, a C name and alias for my domain maybe this is www what dot ever dot com and what happens is I have endpoints so I might have an endpoint ordinarily that absolutely points to on-prem services. But I could also have an endpoint that could point to cloud services. And I can run this in a different mode. There's a performance mode where it redirects you to whichever one is closest to the DNS server making the request. There's a failover mode. So ordinarily it's just going to point everyone on-prem. But if the probe detects, hey, this isn't here, then it can start redirecting users over here instead. So this is actually a good method for if I do need to fail over between on-prem to the cloud, uh, Traffic Manager can really help with that. So that's a good way for those public-facing services, um, how I can do that. Now there's another option. I'm talking a lot about replicating. 
I'm replicating maybe storage, I'm replicating at the hypervisor, the OS, the app. Again, there are things like storage replica in Windows Server 2016. That's all based on the fact that I need to replicate. And I'm either paying for ASR or I'm paying for a VM to be running. What if I have 10 VMs that are just IIS web servers? They have no real state. They talk to a back-end database that, yes, I need to make sure that's replicated. So another option is, if I have services that don't really have any state, rather than worrying about paying for replication or anything else, I could actually just have a template of BHD sitting in here, kind of waiting. Now, in the event of a disaster, there's a technology called VM scale sets. And at that point, it could quickly use this and spin up 10, however many copies I want. It could create them in a few minutes. So I go from zero, all I'm paying for is the VHD to be sitting there. In the event of an actual disaster, run this bit of PowerShell, go and create this VM scale set, and create 10 of them. In five minutes, I've got a 10 node IIS running ready. So I'm not having to pay for replication or VHDs for 10 VMs, I'm just going to create it at that time. So that's another option. So there's a lot of options available here. Hey, I could replicate storage, hypervisor, in OS, app level. Maybe I don't replicate. I just have a template available and I create the scale set if I need it. Of course, there's PaaS services. All these different things. And you might say, well, okay, well, I have SQL, I have domain controllers, I have line of business services. What one do I pick? And you don't. You pick the one that makes the most sense for that workload, for its priority, what SLA I need. So then you're saying, well, that sounds horrible. My DR failover process is going to be so complex. Because you're using SQL always on, I've got multi-master replication domain controllers, I'm using Hyper-V replica, I've got some storage stuff going on over here, I'm going to use some Azure automation, some PowerShell maybe to create some scale sets. I'm never going to be asked. This is so complex. And that's why what I want to do is I have this thing called a recovery plan. So a recovery plan is part of Azure Site Recovery. And what I do is I group my workloads. And I can say, well, first of all, failover VM group 1. Post action, um, call this Azure Automation. Maybe it runs some power, maybe it goes and creates a scale set. Then I want you to go and start VM group two. Then I want you to fail over this SQL always on availability group. Then I want you to fail over VM group three. Then maybe there's a manual action. I can specify that as well. Hey, manual action, just sit and wait. Print some screens to the page. Someone has to go and pull a big lever. They, they do something. Then it will go and do VM group four then go and run this another Azure automation. And lay out the entire failover process. It's all in that recovery plan. And so what I get in the event of an actual disaster, there's really that big red button. Make it red. And I push the button. I push the button and it will run for all of this. So my process in the event of a disaster is I push a button. It doesn't automatically fire. I don't want a disaster recovery process that automatically runs. Maybe there's just a blip in network. The last thing I want is to automate a disaster failover. But once the human has pushed the button, the actual mechanics of the failover process are completely automated, as is the failback. So it doesn't matter if I'm using different technologies. I'm going to bring everything together in a recovery plan that makes it super simple. So in the event of my actual failover, be it a test, if it's a test, it will connect to a different virtual network so it doesn't impact production. If it's real, then obviously it's going to connect to the regular networks. It's going to do everything for me. And this is really the foundation of how I think about using Azure for disaster recovery, for the Microsoft Cloud. Some things, maybe I'm just going to move ahead of time. I don't want to deal with Exchange and SharePoint and Skype in a disaster. I want those there as a cornerstone of how my process is going to work. For other things, hey, my storage, I can use, it's still simple. Maybe I have uh, a SAN that's replicating to an ExpressRoute partner, so it's at their location, it's available via ExpressRoute. 
Maybe I'm replicating from ESX boxes or Hyper-V boxes or physical boxes. I'm replicating in the application. I bring everything together into this click, this easy button. In the event of a true disaster, people may have other priorities. Is my family okay? I need to take care of this. You don't want a 100-page DR failover plan. I want something very nice that's going to automate, that I can test, that is prescriptive, that I know is going to function and bring things up in a certain way. So that's kind of our site recovery. Remember, I have all these different combinations. I can even create things as needed. I hope this was useful. It was really designed to just give a, a fairly high-level view of when I think about DR in Azure, there are, there are lots of options. And you really want to embrace those things. Traffic manager to actually go and balance traffic if it's public-facing, etc. But I hope this helped, and uh, good luck.